Hello, welcome to Mortal Fury. I'm Dean. I'm Chris. Glad you joined us, and we're going to pick right up on part three of the Leslie Schmucker article. And this article is titled, uh, The Uncomfortable Subject Jesus Addressed More Than Anyone Else. If you've been watching, you know that that subject she's talking about is hell. Yep. And the claim that Jesus Christ, while on earth, uh, talked about this place of eternal torture, you know, more than anyone else in the Bible yep. is, is the claim. And that's the uh, standard belief that's just taken for granted. It's a traditional belief that's been around for a long, long time. And you just start there. Mm -hmm. That he talked about this place. And Chris and I, with what we've done looking at this for a long time, looking at these things, we can't find that that's true. We just don't find that that's, in fact, true. So we're trying to break that down for you, and we're trying to encourage you to look up these things yeah. and see well, if it's really true. One of the things you just said immediately, um, you said while Jesus was on the earth, he talked yeah. about the, this topic more than anyone else. And then my mind instantly went to Paul, who learned his evangel from the resurrected Christ. And I'm guessing Paul just chose not to talk about it because surely the resurrected Christ told Paul all about hell. You, you would think Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but, Paul, well, I mean, he claimed to have his evangel to yes. teach from Christ. He called it his evangel. He completed the word of God, wrote these letters. Right. You'd think he'd have on, and devoted he, a whole chapter or a whole book to that or something, but that's not the case. No, he does not talk about hell, Gehenna, any of those. He doesn't talk no, about No, I think that's interesting. If we're going to talk about the one Jesus walking on the earth, I think the one that's resurrected should be uh, listened to as well. So, I mean, I'm going to read a couple things from your article, Leslie. Um, and then Chris is going to pick up on this word. Uh, we're going to go over this word aeon that's used mm -hmm. in scripture and talk about that a little bit and get you to think about that. In your article, you say, uh, because of Adam's sin, we're all guilty and deserve God's eternal punishment. All right, so that's, and, and you're correct in thinking that's Christianity in a nutshell, the majority mm -hmm. uh, of the, of Christianity and the leaders, their doctrines, that's what they believe. Because of Adam's sin, right. you're guilty and deserve eternal punishment. Right. Okay, that's just interesting that we just take that. Is that really true? I mean, that's absurd. Yeah. yeah. That's where we start. Um you also say right here, it's up to us to whether we're going to stay in our state of depravity and be eternally punished or not. So eternal punishment is something that's accepted and not really questioned. Right. It's a default setting. Right. Uh, for all people, good or bad, it doesn't matter. Right. And that's, and it, it gets to the heart of the things we've been talking about, the word hell and the mistranslations um, of uh, Haiti, Sheol, Gehenna, and Tartarus being called hell. And the word we're talking about here, she uses the word eternal five times, eternal four times, eternally once in this article. And she gets that from the Greek word aeon, A-I-O-N. Uh, it's used 193 times in uh, Greek scripture. And it's equivalent in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, is olam, okay? Um, the word aeon, the close, closest English equivalent is eon. And eons have a beginning and an end. And that's very significant. Our KJV, NIV, all of those translations take the word aeon and they mistranslate it into six words, six different words. According to the NIV, aeon means forever, eternal, time, universe, world, and life. That one word has six different words. You stick where you need them to stick so that it continues the message you desire to give. 
That's called a mistranslation. A translation should be the most equivalent word looked at the usage of that word in the day that it was being used, the contextual sentences and paragraphs around it, what was the uh, author conveying, what was the message he was conveying. Uh, so you take the closest word for that word. And aeon should have been eon. Eon, uh, they come close a few times. They call it age or ages, which conveys yeah. a period of period time. time. You know, um, but they miss the boat with these others. And the reason they miss it is because of something called a doctrinal bias. They already start their translation from the position that they have to support it. They need scripture to support what they believe was meant. So rather than do a translation, they do a mistranslation. And um, it's unfortunate because now we, it's the most um, popular religion in the world. And it has the, in the middle of it, it has this horrific story of eternal torment. And right, that, they're, they're supporting that because if you put aeon as the correct English equivalent, eon, Guess what? Guess what falls apart? Mm -hmm. You can't have eternal punishment when you correctly use eon. Right. So if that's there again, it's back to so it's slipped in. Yeah. Over time, to where that became this the thought and the uh, the accepted thing that there's an eternal reality of separation mm -hmm. from God and things like that. That came came in, and so to support it, it's like, oh well, this must mean they started saying eternal fire, the eternal this, the yeah. eternal that in our translations, right? And like I said, with a little bit of research, we're not any kind of scholars or anything, and it gets overwhelming. Oh yeah, and of course bias could come into play. We've been accused of, well, you just want your bias, you <laughs> yeah. want to think something a certain way. Yeah, I just challenge anybody out there who wants to look at these things. I'll, I'll link some articles. Yeah, go to. Go to the scholars that have studied these things out, and you're going to find things, like in the article here I'm reading, all these scholars, showing that the classic Greek writers, talking about the Greek writers, uh, for six centuries, used this word aeon in their yeah. writings. Okay, so you can, like, scholars have studied this out and look at the usage and how, how this word is used and all these things. So you read these things, and you, you find, okay, never once... Did they describe that as some kind of endless eternity and duration? They didn't mm -hmm. use that word like that. So either that's all wrong, it's all conspiracy somehow. We've had all these scholars. Right, right. You even get into the Christian and theological scholars that I've read about. They give in to that, the Old Testament, mm -hmm. Hebrew word, olam, and all this. They give in to, okay, yeah, it's not, it's not used in an eternal way. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, they give in to that. And well, we obviously see that. You see that hell and eternity and hell, fire, and all that's not talked about in the Old Testament at all. No. You can't find that. No. Olam is the Hebrew word that they use. And if you look at it, it again renders as periods of time. There's a beginning and an end. The word eternal really should just be applied to God because eternal really means no beginning and no end. And that's who God is. He's had right. no beginning right. and will have no ending. So eternal really should be a reference only to God. And, yeah, that's, and it's a fine, good word to use. Absolutely. That's a good Nothing point. wrong with it. Nothing wrong with eternity. Right. Well, of course there's all the saints. But what about what Scripture says about eons to come, ages to come? Right. Are, are there other ages to come? Scripture speaks of that, that there's other ages to come. It's very, very interesting. In, uh, in, order, in order for the our scriptures to make sense, you have to have consistency. You don't have consistency when you use six different words to describe one Greek word. When you look into these things and, and the scholars that study scripture, then you'll start finding some things that really don't line up and make sense. Yeah. So within the KJV, scholars have said they, they look and they look at the errors that were made and are constantly trying to correct that, you know, the best that they can. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so with kind of going what you said, if that word is everlasting, then you would have to say, as the KJV does with this Aaronic priesthood, is an everlasting priesthood when clearly that it's stated that it comes to an end. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't. It, it can't, can't be an everlasting priesthood. It can't be priesthood. E everlasting to use it. Same thing with Jonah in the belly of the well forever. Yeah. And um, is he still, he's in the belly of the well forever. Yeah. So there, there, there's a lot of examples. There are that. inconsistencies that we can point out that show this. Uh, Martin has a great uh, article called The Eons. Uh, Dean's going to link it, and it's great. And he uses five verses in Matthew to show how eon is the absolute best or eon is the absolute best word to describe these things. If you use some of these other words, it's ridiculous. You can't have eternity of the eternities. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, and they discovered that, and that's when they started using age of the ages, which is close. That makes sense. That makes sense. You got an, yeah, you got an eon of the eons, an age of the ages. Right, right. That makes sense. But a forever um, and a ever... Right, and she Doesn't uses this eternal word, like I said, five times. And if you take that word out and you correctly translate Scripture, then this doctrine of eternal torment falls apart. And uh, that's the that's the point we're wanting to make. We we showed earlier how hell, the word hell, has been used in our uh, Bibles to depict something, and it's an incorrect translation of four different words. And over time, scholars then begin parsing that out, and Dean and I go, why, why, do we, why are we not using Young's Analytical? Why are we not using the Rotherham? Why are we not looking at the Debar translation? Mm -hmm. Most translations do not have hell in there, mm -hmm. and they correctly... Uh, put E on in place of A on. I mean, what? Who's not going to ask that question? Why are there? Why is there not more consistency here? It it bears looking into. We we mm -hmm. said last week Proverbs twenty five, two says you know it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the glory of kings to investigate a matter. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're always talking about here. Is question some of this stuff and look one layer underneath. It's amazing what you find and mm -hmm. how much more scripture means to us when it doesn't contradict one another. Mm -hmm. Check out this contradiction. Back on the, the line that I read here from Leslie and then makes me think of um, how, how I used to think and that you, you accept things as just being true. So I guess it's taught from an early age and here's what the Bible says mm -hmm. and there's this eternal hell because it's right here in the Bible. And that's about as far as it gets. Um, you don't really go any further. But then I also wonder why more... Uh, don't really, really think about what we believe within those doctrines. Like she says, we're all guilty and deserve God's eternal punishment. She goes on to say right after that, contrary to popular belief, hell is not a place where God sends those who have been especially bad. It's our default setting. It's our default destination. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the 5th century that this yeah. doctrine of eternal torment became a accepted doctrine. Uh, we know St. Augustine had a part mm -hmm. to play in that and a couple others. I can't come up with their names right now, but others played a big part in a doctrinal bias that supports this, Dean and I say, doctrine of demons. Yeah, it's, it's not no, accurate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lie. So you, you, when you look at that evidence, you at least say, okay, well, something's going on here. Mm -hmm. What's really going on? Uh, what's interesting 
like I said, to her point here, hell is not a place where God sends those who have been especially bad. What she's meaning there is so many times we want and long for justice yeah. in this world and yeah. justice for all the bad and the evil. And Chris and I both agree, you know, we want that. So it's easy to think, well, I want Hitler to go to hell. Mm -hmm. He deserves it. You know, I want this bad person really to bad go person. there. The Ted Bundys. Right. Okay, so we, we get that. But like what she admits and what she points out, it's hell is her grandkids yeah. default setting. Yeah. It's their destination. Not only is it their destination, they deserve to go there. <laughs> yeah. They deserve it. Okay? So that's Christianity in a nutshell. That's where you start. Yeah. Now, I, I just question how is that what you believe deep down? You know, is that, yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's what I believe. That's what's been revealed to me as a good mm -hmm. student of Scripture. It's been revealed to me by God on high that my grandkids deserve eternal punishment. Really? I mean, preach it then. Go out there and preach it. <laughs> Stand on it. Yeah. And see how that sits. I mean, that just doesn't make sense, no, right? It no. doesn't make sense. It's why you why? call this an uncomfortable Well, yeah, it's subject. uncomfortable. It's absurd. Right? Yeah. That's why it's so uncomfortable. It, because, is the ridiculousness of it and the hypocrisy of it. Yeah, believing in, in a God and a Savior that yeah. set it up that way, that all these, you know, you deserve punishment, and it's up to you to get out of it. Savior's not going to do anything. His sons mm -hmm. can't do anything for you. Right? He's not, all he's done is given you an opportunity. You yeah, it's, it's, it. yeah, it's a potential. He's you, a potential you say savior. say it in the next line. Yeah. It's up to you. You got two options. Yeah. Um, so if you just think of that, it's like, does that really make sense? Is that the God that I worship? And, but like you state, and you get this from Sproul, I guess. Um, and we played that clip. If you mm -hmm. haven't seen it, go back to part one. I think we played the Sproul clip. A couple clip, times. yeah. Where he has to get. He admits that it's uncomfortable. Yeah. But he gets to the point of somehow we're gonna. He's so sanctified. Yeah, we're going to praise God watching our own mother burn in hell. Yeah. And we'll praise God for that. <laughs> I mean, that there's something going on there if you really believe that. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, you don't have to believe that. You know, if you're the a Christian, family, that's what they believe, though. I know. The family, to me, is a beautiful example that God gives us that we have here on earth and our expression either as a child to our parents, or us as parents to our child. Which one of you can accept the idea of shunning a child to that point? Now, I know people have done this. They've shunned their kids. It, it, it blows me away. I cannot think of not only shunning them, but requiring them to be in a place that keeps them alive so that they can feel the exquisite pain that they're going to suffer for all eternity. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's so crazy and so out there. It absolutely begs study and investigation. Right. Yeah. We, and, and I think you'll find, hopefully you'll find out there that this, uh, this teaching even though it's it's um, it's wrapped in this package of love, presented in a package oh, of yeah. love and God and how much he loves you and Jesus Christ is a savior and we've got scripture here directly from God and mm -hmm. come listen to this. So it's wrapped in all this love talk. This this message, this poison is in there. Right. Um and so we think it's it's a teaching of yeah, demonic beings that slipped in. Right. It's not about teaching of the real God and his son, Jesus Christ. It's not at all. Listen to what Paul says here, 1 Timothy. Now, the Spirit is saying explicitly that in subsequent errors, some will be withdrawn from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and the teachings of demons and the hypocrisy of false expressions, their own conscience having been cauterized, forbidding to marry, abstaining from foods, which God creates to be taken with thanksgiving by those who believe and realize the truth. Um, 
so yeah, has our conscience, has people's conscience been, you know, seared or right, or cauterized? Something's happened, yeah. And we see it now that it, yeah, it is like a brainwashing, or you have to be to get okay with this, mm -hmm. to get okay with your grandkids. Say, yeah, damn right, they deserve hell. And they're going there. Yeah, that then there's something not right there. Right. Just a few lines later, how does it line up with this then? Faithful of the saying and worthy of all welcome. For this we are toiling, being reproached, <laughs> that we rely on the living God, who is the Savior of all mankind. Yep. Especially how's believers. That, how's that fit right? with that? So how is he the Savior of all mankind if most everybody suffering in hell forever? That just right there doesn't make sense. I, I think uh, Martin says at the end of his article, that when Aeon is correctly translated, you begin to see that God is dealing with mankind in periods of time. Mm -hmm. Dean and I know this. We believe this wholeheartedly. There are five eons. We are in the third wicked eon right now. Many think we're at the end of the third wicked eon. But there is a purpose to Aeon, Aeonian, Eon. There's a purpose to it. God has a purpose yeah. in it. Let me share what how Martin puts this. I, I, I can't do it any better than Martin does. In truth, God operates everything in accord with the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1.11. Nothing has ever happened which was not in perfect accord with God's plans and intentions. All is out of God, through God, and for God. Romans 11.36. And what is God's plan? What is the purpose of the eons? It's this to head up the universe in his son, Christ Jesus, that's Ephesians 1, 10 through 12, to reconcile the universe to himself through Christ, making peace through the blood of Christ's cross, Colossians 1, 20. Why? So that at the consummation of the eons, the very end, God will be all in all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 22 to 28. That, that is beautiful revelation of how God's working all this out in periods of time, not this eternal torment crap. All right. All right. Well, hopefully uh, you look into that word a little bit yeah. and see what you discover. Look at the articles that he's going to link. All right. And, um, um, we're all hoping you have a good week. And... Um, Hope you're enjoying this study as much as we are bringing it to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, no telling where we'll where we'll get to next week, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yep. So thanks for joining us. Love y'all. Take care. See you next week. Bye.